All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here this afternoon. Um, we are here for our Medical Scholar Seminar Series. So this is a series, as I think most of you in this room have heard, um, that was that is named in honor of BTCSOM's first uh, Dean of Research, uh, Timothy Johnson. And his vision was really this idea of bringing in uh, faculty who were trained as physicians, but are actively doing research. And so we feel like um, this is a great uh, seminar series to encourage our students, our medical students and our graduate students to see what the intersection of, of medical education and graduate education can really result in. So um, today we have a, a speaker that I'm going to turn the, the mic over to Dr. Andrew Binks to introduce. Uh, thank you. Um, usually when we introduce somebody, we go through the highlights of their CV. I'm going to put yours down. It's kind of heavy. Um, so in the first of these series, um, you had a classmate, uh, Mia, introduce her mentor. And um, you're seeing the same thing here again, uh, apart from a little grayer, I think, all around. Um, back in 2009, I wanted to change the direction of my, my basic science, and I was going out of my comfort zone, and I needed help. The help came unconditionally from Dr. Leiter. He traveled miles to come onto my campus to help me. Uh, the help was kind, enthusiastic, no strings attached, and it was great fun working uh, with him in the office to try and put protocols together, to put grants together. And he's been an important guide in my career. So it's with great honor, I can just give us some brief highlights of your CV. Uh, uh, Jada does um, medical degree at, at Dartmouth. Uh, he took a year off. During that year off, he was the uh, Parker B. Francis Fellow. Uh, and not really a year off, that's any of you that end up in pulmonary research will find out how prestigious that award is. He was, um, he's had numerous NIH grants, over 150 peer-reviewed publications. When I was in Boston and we were looking at uh, dyspnea, we went to Jay's group to find out what was what in terms of control of breathing. It was a highly respected group. He is now a uh, Emeritus faculty is still at Dartmouth, and on his CV it says active, because in that emeritus status, he is co-PI still on four RO1s, plus a couple of other grants. So it is with great pleasure and great honor that I invite him to come and talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. I always wonder if I can live up to the introduction, so you'll have to be the judge of that at the end of the hour. Um, here are my, oops, conflicts of interest. I do have R01 grants. Um, scientists are all fascinated by their lineage, so I trained with so-and-so who trained with so-and-so who was a student of Thomas Hunt Morgan or, or something like that. So. I will mention a couple of my colleagues because uh, some of you will know them. At Harvard Medical School, Susan DeMickey is uh, one of my colleagues and she's in Anthony's family, extended family. And uh, Robin Haynes is a neuropathologist. Uh, she was trained by Robin, uh, by uh, Hannah Kinney and Hannah Kinney is really a giant in the field of uh, neuropathology, both for periventricular leukomalacia, which is, what cerebral palsy is associated with, as well as uh, in sudden infant death syndrome. And I'll send you, show you work that she was instrumental in. Um, the renal research work is done with a man named Brian Lucas and uh, Andy Dobbinsbeck, who's a lot bioengineer and it involves computer modeling. And I was saying at lunch that I couldn't, I, I've had really very happy professional relationships with uh, PhDs and with physicians, but uh, Andy has a degree of mathematical knowledge that I do not possess, but benefit from. Uh, I have grants with a neurosurgeon at UCLA, 
uh, related to trying to repair spinal cord injury using external stimulation. So very interested in controlling electrical activity in the brain and using it that. And uh, I had a nice conversation with Dr. Friedlander this morning in there. So I don't think we're quite family members, but we're maybe we're professional cousins. Um, and then I have some NSF support uh, that has to do with deep brain stimulation. And I talked to Reed uh, Montague and we didn't know it, but we're related. So uh, I also started a small company to make a drug that's a nanoparticle that has antioxidant properties. And I just, if any of you do this, everybody in Silicon Valley says, oh, you just have to fail and fail and fail again. You just have to be prepared to fail. And, and it's really great. It is terrible. It is not really great. They are liars. It's miserable to fail. And we've done a good job at it. It's, it's a project that's barely alive. And then I'm the chief medical officer and a consultant. This is what I did to pay for college. It turned out to be fascinating uh, to be involved in the design of larger clinical trials, often using really complicated and fun statistics. And I, you know, physicians, you mentioned statistics, their eyes roll over, roll back in their heads. But if you have an opportunity, learn more about statistics. It is a way of establishing what Stephen Colbert would call the truthiness of scientific things. And it, 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 I, I found it to be fascinating and lead to interesting ideas about the philosophy of science and, and epistemology, which is the branch of uh, philosophy that deals with how we know what we know. So at least try not to react that way to statistics and have an open mind. Okay. I keep forgetting. Okay, what's not covered is the large number of people I've had, the generous collaborations. I strongly encourage all of you as you move through your professional career to seek colleagues. Uh, collaborate, share discovery, the numerous friendships, the pleasure of intellectual disputation, finding someone that you can fight with productively is really a gift. And the exploration of topics that I would not otherwise have pursued. There's no way I would be do looking at cardiovascular dynamics were it not for Brian Lucas for example. Okay, so now on to the topic of the day. We are interested in sudden infant death syndrome, and sudden infant death syndrome has a very unusual definition. It uh, happens in a baby between one, one month and one year of age, and it doesn't have a known cause. So part of the analysis of the death scene is, is there anything that we could figure out that could cause this? And the reason for that definition is that the observation starting in the 1960s was that these are normal babies who are put to bed and uh, don't wake up. But then that means that anything that abnormal that you can define uh, excludes it from being sudden infant death syndrome. So if I told you right now, I know the cause of sudden infant death syndrome, it can't be SIDS because I know the cause. So it's, it's, an, it's a very odd definition and it, it causes, it, I think it causes some problems, which I'll try to point out. So I don't have that bias that they're normal babies, even though that's why the definition is made that way. I think that they have abnormalities. It's just that they're hard to define. And I think that there are physiological processes that are abnormal in these babies, and I'll try to point them out. So there have been three fields that have contributed to knowledge in this. Epidemiology, which is based on case-controlled studies in which you say these babies died of SIDS, these infants did not, what's different about them, and you identify those factors that are associated with risks of dying, having a baby die of SIDS. Pathology, uh, there are brain banks that people developed over time, uh, mainly in California because of the favorable laws regarding consent to autopsy. Um, and uh, these brains have been examined and there are some subtle defects that have been found that I think are important. Uh, and then physiology, and we've done mainly the physiological part and we're late in the game. We have tried to say plausibly how risk factors or these pathological abnormalities that have been found might work through processes, what processes might be abnormal in these babies that would contribute to their deaths. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to emphasize uh, the pathology and the physiology, but I am going to start with a little discussion of uh, the epidemiology. Since many of you are in the age where you're going to have children, I feel a public health obligation to uh, tell you that uh, babies who sleep on their backs and then place on their stomachs have a higher risk of SIDS. There's something about sleeping face down that is associated with the risk. 
This was particularly true in Australia and New Zealand, where they had very soft betting uh, in the 1980s and 90s that became possible, uh, popular, and the incidence of SIDS just, relatively speaking, skyrocketed there. So the epidemiologists in Australia and New Zealand have made a major contribution to understanding these risk factors. So babies are at higher risk if they sleep on their stomach, sleep on soft surfaces, uh, sleep under soft or loose bedding, get too hot during sleep, exposed to cigarette smoke. Maternal cigarette smoking is the single largest risk factor for sudden infant dysphermia. It has the highest odds ratio of, of any of these activity. Uh, Co-sleeping, even though that's true in most third world societies, is actually a risk factor in first world societies, especially if the baby's covered, uh, the adult smokes or has had alcohol, or the baby sleeps with more than one bed share, and the baby is younger than 11 to 14 weeks. The peak incidence of SIDS is between two and six months. The definition allows any infant who dies between the age of one and uh, one month and one year falls into the category. And this is all taken from the NICHD. The prevention of SIDS is a simple epidemiological approach. Create a safe sleep environment. And a safe sleep environment looks like an abstract painting. There's nothing in it, okay? It's a bare, firm mattress, no toys, no soft, cuddly little toys that your grandmother gives you, your mother gives you to have the, with the baby. Completely spare. Mothers and parents in general overdress the children, so they don't need all those extra blankets. Get them out of there. They're actually stacked so that you can put your baby in to keep them warm. You don't want them to get too hot. Foster breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is associated with a reduced risk of SIDS. I'm not going to talk too much about it this, but I think that's actually a brain development issue. It fosters greater brain development. Uh, it's the Goldilocks of baby foods. Uh, and no maternal smoking or drinking. And some countries where um, people are better behaved and uh, less interested in uh, individual rights than we are. Uh, women actually stop smoking for pre when they're pregnant. They take it up when the baby's older, but they do stop during the pregnancy and they have much lower uh, incidence of SIDS. I'm thinking primarily of Holland. I think when these rules were promulgated, uh, Queen Beatrix said that uh, every baby in Holland will sleep on its back and mothers must stop smoking. And the next day, it was true, okay? They're just much better behaved uh, following public health me measures than we are. So this is the origin of the Back to Sleep campaign. The Back to Sleep campaign has been renamed Safe Sleep Environment, and I'll tell you a little bit of why that is. And, um, but any of you who subsequently have children, the baby should be put to sleep on, on its back. Breastfeeding should be promoted. No smoking, limited or no alcohol during pregnancy please go to the website and follow all the rules. It, it can have an impact as I'll show you. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to talk about the limits of causality of uh, epidemiology. Uh, this is a map of London and it's related to the uh, cholera outbreak that occurred there in 1854. And John Snow mapped out the location of uh, the events, each of these little buildings means that there was a cholera victim there. And he noticed that they were all circulated around this one location, which is where the pump was. And the pump was contaminated. The well was contaminated with water that had seeped in from the Thames. And uh, the uh, cholera was therefore originated from this contaminated well that served the community. So the treatment, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, required no knowledge of the germ theory, no pathogens identified in the water, Nothing that we would consider a mechanistic understanding of the disorder was required. So, and uh, removing, he removed the pump handle and removing that, the, um, the, the epidemic, uh, the outbreak was, was uh, fully contained. Okay, so if we look at that in terms of SIDS, we don't know what aspects of infantile physiology are altered by the interventions that actually reduce the risk of SIDS. And yet as a physiologist, that's what interests me. Uh, we cannot refine therefore in particular infants that says, well, you know, this baby has this risk factor that is associated with this physiological process. So you need to do this. We don't do that. We don't have that. We, 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 we don't have that level of detail. So nevertheless, the Back to Sleep campaign was a big success, and I'll show you that in a moment, sort of. 
Now, the reason I say sort of is another interesting phenomenon and so typical of uh, physicians to change the rule as they go along. SIDS are now uh, defined as sudden infant death syndrome. These are deaths that have the death scene investigation. They use a doll, they recreate, they make sure that there's no cause. These are the ones you, I don't, this baby, this is a normal baby who was put to sleep. I don't have any idea what happened, how this could have happened. There's accidental suffocation. These are babies who are found face down, often with a blanket, sometimes with their head stuck at the side of the crib. There's a plausible belief on the part of the medical examiners that in some way, uh, the airway was partially or completely obstructed and the baby uh, couldn't breathe or was strangled in bed by the bedclothes. And then there's the combined rate. And what you can see is that after the back to sleep campaign started about 1992 in the United States, there's a very gratifying drop off in the incidence of SIDS. And here it is again, and it appears to keep going down a little bit, but in fact, accidental suffocation went up, so the total death rate has been stable. And the, as the, this SIDS rate was changing, the number of babies put to sleep on their back was not changing. It's been stuck at about 85% since about 2000. 85% of babies are put to sleep uh, on their back as they should be, and that hasn't changed, despite the fact that beyond that time, the rate continued to change. This is called diagnostic drift, and um, This is caused because the MEs think they know the cause, which is suffocation or strangulation, therefore it can't be SIDS. Uh, but I would argue, and, and I'll try to make comments later, that these babies have an abnormal arousal response from the apnea and normal babies would struggle, would twist around, would push away, would move in some way to try to decrease the airway obstruction. And these babies didn't appear to do that. So. I do not agree that these babies are normal, even though they're now given a diagnostic label that no longer fits, strictly speaking, under the SIDS uh, label. So this is the mental framework with which the, the, the structure with which we approach SIDS. This is, was put together by Jim Filiano and Hannah Kinney. Uh, they were both part of our, uh, Hannah was the leader of our program project grant. Jim was a participant early on. and. Um, the idea here is that there's a critical development mental period somewhere between two and six months. There are exogenous stressors, covers over the head, being face down somehow. Uh, and it's a vulnerable infant that maybe the infant looks normal, but isn't truly normal. And that these all combine. And when this Venn diagram intersects, then the baby's uh, at higher risk for SIDS. So there are problems with the triple risk model. Uh, first, when it first came out, many people had similar ideas, and there were lots of editorials and complaints that this isn't original, it's just capturing the zeitgeist, what everybody thinks, and um, it's not that helpful. It's not specific. Uh, Nemirov, who's a giant in the study of depression, uh, has a triple risk model for depression. He could have a triple risk model for coronary artery disease, okay? Uh, so that's not very helpful. It's not clear what each of the circles actually represents. If you have some, uh, you know, if you're face down, is that an exogenous stressor, but you don't respond? Is, you know, is that, in, is that, a, is that a vulnerability or is that a stressor? It's, it's not clear where you would put the various risk factors. It's not mechanistic. Nevertheless, this has been incredibly valuable as a framework for understanding uh, how to think about SIDS and how to frame research questions. Uh, even given all its inaccuracies and weaknesses, this has still been a tremendous uh, boon to the field. Um, it, it's funny to me how sort of mundane things uh, can turn out to have big impacts. And one of the best examples is that is about 30 years ago, cardiologists got together and they said, we're going to have a thing called MACE, Major Adverse Cardiac Events. And that become the, became the outcome of virtually every cardiovascular study. And suddenly, every interventional study in cardiology is counting oranges. They're count, counting the same thing. And you know, it's this process thing. It had a tremendous impact on cardiological research. And this is the same thing. 
it, it's kind of simple minded, but it was very, very useful. However, I think it's time to move beyond description to mechanism. And um, that's what the rest of the talk will be about. This is a figure that uh, Bob Darnell, who's a colleague, put together. And it's to try to show how the, the various risk factors might interact. If there's brainstem dysfunction, which I'm going to tell you about, if there's chronic hypoxia, which I'm going to mention, prematurity, maternal smoking, a critical period of development, then and you have a severe sort of inborn vulnerability, then you can have SIDS in non-asphyxiating circumstances. On the other hand, if you're truly a normal infant, you can still have a sudden infant death between one year, one month and one year if you have extreme external circumstances, extreme uh, exogenous factors like severe asphyxia. And Bob wants you to believe that there's a spectrum along here. I, I sort of buy this, but I think even the babies who died of severe asphyxia are not necessarily fully normal in terms of their responses to uh, hypoxia and stressful circumstances. Uh, furthermore, the risk factors for asphyxial death and for SIDS are the same, making me think that the processes which I'm going to talk about are, are involved in both of them. And uh, I think that asphyxial death still may involve a brainstem defect. And I'm not sure that renaming it is really helpful. So the safe leaves have worked, but the number of infants put to sleep supine has plateaued. And uh, in addition, there has been a general trend in the background that infant mortality has gone down generally. Uh, and the problem is that uh, th this postneonatal mortality has kind of masked some of the problems of the diagnostic uh, categorization. And in addition, the back to sleep campaign involves more than just putting the baby back to sleep. So prenatal care has increased, breastfeeding is uh, increased, the frequency of breastfeeding is increased or the incidence of breastfeeding. And so the safe sleep environment was not the sole element of the overall invention. So it turns out uh, have been successful. And my public health message to you is, even though what I'm about to tell you uh, undercuts it a little bit, every child should be put to sleep on its back. People who do that tend to follow the other strictures of the safe sleep and their babies are less likely to die of sudden infant death syndrome. The curious statistical fact is that when you do multiple regression, you can't actually attribute the success of the back to sleep campaign in this current guise to the back to sleep part of the back to sleep campaign. It turns out that breastfeeding and the other elements are, are statistically more powerful in terms of modifying the risk to SIDS. So I, I think there's kind of a little um, uh, irony in, in, in that, but put your child to sleep on its back. When it's ready, it will roll over, then it can control its own position. But at the start, they should all be put to sleep on their back, breastfeeding and all the other good things. The other thing is that like the pump handle, epidemiology is a blunt tool to understand physiological problems and mes uh, mechanisms of disease. Pump handles don't actually cause cholera, okay? So now I want to talk about physiology and pathology, which is what we've done. Uh, there was a trend to monitor babies in the 1980s, hoping that when they became apneic, an alarm would go off and you could rescue the baby. And there are two problems. First, the alarms didn't work very well. There were way too many false positives and a lot of false negatives. A lot of babies died and the alarms never went off. This was torture for parents. Uh, babies may have improved their sleep with mo monitoring, but the monitoring was a disaster for parental sleep. Um, and, but as a result, some babies who died of sudden infant death syndrome were captured, and these are records from them. And what you can see, here's the uh, heart rate, and here's the respiratory record, is that the heart rate is generally tending down, respiration is irregular, and then there's a long apnea. And I think this is a primary hypoxic apnea, which I'll explain in a bit. And then there's a big gasp. And the gasping is uh, controlled by a pacemaker set of neurons in the brainstem, which has been given the terrible name of the preboxinger complex. It's terrible because it's not functional. It previously had a name as a gasping center, which was functional, which is a shame to rename it with the name of a cheap wine from the Alsace region of Europe. And the pre is actually behind or caudal to the Botzinger complex. So 
multiple reasons I don't like it. Nonetheless, that's where these pacemaker neurons sit. Eupnea, which you're all doing right now, is actually uh, driven by a half-center model, which requires reciprocal inhibition. There's no pacemaker neurons driving your normal respiration. It's only this, I think of it, more primitive form that is driven by a pacemaker neuron, and those neurons reside in the pre complex, and they're integrated into the normal network, this kind of relay race of inspiratory, post-inspiratory, expiratory, pre-inspiratory neurons that the baton of respiratory activity uh, gets passed through. Um, here's a gas where there's an increase in heart rate. There's also, it turns out, an increase in blood pressure. And I think this is an important part of successful autoresuscitation. And I'll point that out in a minute. This was actually one that was unsuccessful. There was a final burst of increase in heart rate, but ultimately the baby died. And the death is usually initially the failure of respiration and then the failure of the uh, cardiac system. But what it seems is that there's a beginning with apnea, the apnea persists, bradycardia develops, and then gasping develops. And this often happens serially. And every time it happens, the apneas are longer and the recovery is less effective. So it's as if some evil humor is building up or some good thing is running down. So this is what it looks like when a baby escapes. You see uh, a breath here, a big gasp, and then you see the heart rate recovered. And then there's a break in this record. It's too bad it's not continuous. But six minutes later, regular respiration was reestablished and this baby recovered. So there is apnea, bradycardia, gasping occurs, and then there is successful recovery, reestablishing eupnea, the heart rate recovers, uh, and often there's an arousal. The these occur during sleep and the baby wakes up. And this process of gasping and arousal waking up is called autoresuscitation. So apneas and bradycardia to start, autoresuscitation uh, leads to success. So any theory of the proximate cause of SIDS must account for what causes the apneas and bradycardia and what leads to successful uh, autoresuscitation. And our hypothesis, our working hypothesis is that both those things are abnormal in the babies who are at risk of dying for SIDS. And we spent the last 25 years trying to figure out what are physiologically plausible mechanisms. And the problem of mechanism is nuanced and harks back to the definition of SIDS. If we have a defined diagnosis pointing to a mechanism, it cannot be SIDS. I actually think it's time for a new definition of SIDS, and I know that I'm not alone in that. But it is in getting a group of physicians and scientists to sit in a room and agree on anything. That is a contentious process, and I'm not sure I'm young enough to take that on. Uh, but I do think that a, a positive definition, rather than this definition by what it's not, uh, would be helpful at this time. There's another phenomenon that's going on, and it harks back to the definition, because if you know what caused the death, it's not SIDS. So it turns out that uh, there are other definable disorders that cause sudden death in infancy. There are some genetic syndromes, both metabolic and cardiac. Long QT syndrome is a popular one maybe is involved in two to 5% of deaths from sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, there are some other, um, well, I can say at, at Children's Hospital Boston, they're doing genome sequencing now to find out what the genetic abnormalities are in each baby who died of SIDS. They're actually finding a fair number of de novo mutations. Uh, they are often channelopathies um, and they may or may not contribute to cardiac disorders. Some people think that the babies are having seizures and uh, sudden unexplained death and epilepsy, SUDEP, is a phenomenon that spans all ages. And the idea is people think uh, that this inhibits breathing, causes apnea, and then there's prolonged hypoxia and uh, death on that basis. There are unknown causes which are currently classified as SIDS. There's SIDS and there's asphyxia. And um, so people are trying to split these off and, and if they're successful, eventually the diagnosis of SIDS would disappear. But I think this is backwards. And the reason I think it's backwards is that the observations we have, they're the only observations, are that apnea and bradycardia are the main thing. So rather than seeing these as separate entities, I would think of these as contributing to problems of bradycardia, arousal, and cardiorespiratory instability. 
And in the original descriptions of the association of long QT syndrome, those descriptions showed that there were apneas and then the arrhythmias that can, long QT syndrome can cause occurred. So that long QT syndrome in isolation wasn't the cause of death. It was the cause of death in combination with the occurrence of apnea. And I think the same might be a set of seizures. Why is it that seizures cause apnea and bradycardia and then a failed out uh, arousal? And uh, again, I said asphyxia, I think that their response to asphyxia isn't uh, normal, that they, even these babies who are labeled as asphyxial deaths had abnormalities of arousal. So defining the causes of apnea, bradycardia, and then autoresuscitation should be helpful in all these entities. So here's my working hypothesis in one simple diagram. Uh, I think there are apnogenic reflexes. They originate from cranial nerves. The diving reflex is the fifth cranial nerve. The laryngeal chemo reflex, which I'll show you, is mediated by the vagus. When stuff gets into the larynx, it causes apnea in babies. You actually have one of these, uh, but you just, <clears throat> that's the LCR in you. So the babies, however, have a much more vigorous response. And it's like other reflexes. As babies mature, their reflex profile changes. The Moreau reflex, maybe you've seen that. That's the startle reflex in a baby. That disappears by about six months. So having these trajectories uh, isn't that surprising. Uh, and then hypoxic apnea is mediated by the ninth cranial nerve from the carotid body. You, ventilation is stimulated in you by hypoxia. It's stimulated initially in the babies, but then it causes apnea, primary hypoxic apnea. Um, so they get apnea from one of these mechanisms, I think. I think obstruction is a less common cause of apnea in this setting, though not impossible. And then they have decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, increased CO2, and really hypoxia is the main culprit. And then they can have cardiovascular collapse, drop in blood pressure, ischemia to vital organs and death. Or if gasping is successful, if they swallow and clear the airway, if they cough, if they move around, then autoresuscitation can be successful and they arouse, tilt, change the environment, and resume normal breathing. So inhibition promotes apnea and bradycardia. This is really dependent on inhibitory phenomenon. Excitation is really important in reversing this in the process of autoresuscitation. Now, um, I have one little editorial. I actually don't think the fifth cranial nerve um, has that much. The receptors are in the nose. They're activated generally by cold. This is the dive reflex. And so, um, I find that less plausible, but the laryngeal chemo reflex on hypoxic ap primary hypoxic apnea, I think are strong contenders uh, for causes of, or are the gateway uh, to SIDS. So just a word about inhibition. Uh, in utero, respiratory activity is inhibited. The baby is essentially anesthetized by allopregnanolone levels, which is a neurosteroid and adenosine. And the breathing is intermittent very little practice, and yet the baby has to be born and be able to breathe. And um, it, uh, so that, but, but mainly it's, it's inhibited. So it looks as if inhibitory circuits develop early and are strong. And delayed development, I think cigarette smoking causes decreased uterine blood flow, causes hypoxia. I think the intermittent restriction of oxygen in the uh, fetus leads to a, um, a restriction of ATP availability, which essentially slows down the development of the brain. So these babies are born, they look age appropriate, but I think their brains are a little bit immature for uh, their stated uh, gestational age. And I think that inhibition, inhibitory phenomenon are potent and they're not fully ready for the excitation that's necessary to live in an air breathing environment. So we see evidence of insufficient robustness in the excitatory circuits, arousal, autoresuscitation, and the stability of apnea. There's a, of eupnea. There's a phenomenon called the apnea of prematurity, which is a periodic phenomenon, which also reflects, among other things, immaturity of the brain. And um, prematurity, is, which is associated with apnea of prematurity, is also associated with uh, SIDS. So this is the laryngeal chemoreflex. This is from a, a piglet who was asleep that we had instrumented. We put a little bit of water into the larynx here. There's a swallow, uh, some coughing. Then there's a long apnea. 
And then this is the duration of the laryngeal chemo reflex, and this is the duration of the apnea. And this is what we measure to count, to count uh, the LCR. And we elicited this serially, and then we looked at what happens in the brainstem that might modify this reflex, and that's, that's the output for our experiments. And, and what's interesting is that as the piglet matures, this part persists, swallowing, coughing, the apnea, goes away. In these animals, we never saw a great deal of bradycardia, and I, I, I don't know why that is. This is what it looks like in a rodent. And uh, here's the respiratory activity. This is integrated EMG activity from the diaphragm. And you can see we put it in, here's this period of apnea, and then breathing is slowly restored. Not much bradycardia in the EKG. We study P7 to P15 infants. Whenever you study rats, you're always kind of a rat developmental uh, biologist. If you study adult behaviors, you're a rat psychiatrist, you know, put them in an open field. Are they really anxious or are they feeling something uniquely ratty? You know, is this really a human analog? Always ask about that, but, or wonder about it. So we think that P7 to P15 uh, is what the infant age is. Um, uh, that's our best guess, and, but it, it's just that, a guess. Um, this is a picture of what the circuitry of the laryngeal chemoreflex is. All cranial nerves have A and C fibers. A fibers are myelinated and conduct quickly. That's the, their nomenclature is based on their conduction velocities. A fibers kind of give you information about the world during daily life. I just swallowed, there's food in my mouth, you know, stuff like that. C fibers are unmyelinated and they're mainly nociceptive. Something bad's happening, I'm getting burned, there's something caustic, there's inflammation, I should be worried, tissue could be injured, okay? So the, the information they carry is somewhat segregated. In either case, both of the uh, nerve terminals release glutamate on second order neurons within the nucleus of the solitary tract, which is kind of at the rostral end, of the medulla, but the back end, it's near the fourth ventricle. And um, these second order neurons, which have never been that carefully identified, appear to interact with the ventral respiratory group and they freeze respiration in a post-inspiratory pause. And um, this has been called post-inspiratory apneusis. Apneusis is seen when you get stuck in one phase or the other of a breathing. So. At the end of inspiration, if you hold the inspiration for a long time, that's an apneustic period. This would be expiratory, post-expiratory apneusis. So you can't get the expiratory neurons that are necessary to pass the baton to continue that relay race. It, it gets stuck there. It's as if someone uh, in the middle of the race uh, stands there and said, I've had it. I don't like you, coach. I'm not running anymore. Okay. And so they're stuck in that phase. So greater laryngeal stimulation, greater glutamate release, more profound apneas and respiratory inhibition. So people think that thermal stress is a risk factor for SIDS. The covering is not only changing the gas concentration that the infant breathes, but also elevating their temperature or the temperature of their head. Babies lose an incredible amount of heat from the head, far more than adults, and a lot of it from the face. And if you warm the face, it's a respiratory inhi inhibitor. So we asked the question, what happens if we heat these little piglets up? And we found that when we heated the little piglets up, they were hotter by one, one degree. The laryngeal chemoreflex got a lot longer. And when we tried to figure why, why that was, we studied TRIP-V1 antagonists. TRIP-V1s are transient receptor potential. They're thermosensitive. If you feel heat or if you taste something hot in food, that's because TRIP-V1 receptors are activated, okay? Uh, and uh, they're nonspecific uh, calcium channel. So if they get activated, they're presynaptic. They increase the amount of calcium where the glutamate vesicles are. So if you increase the amount of calcium, more glutamate is released. And it's our idea that that leads to prolongation of the LCR. And when we blocked trip V1 channels, so we have hyperthermia here, apnea, and the LCR got longer. Here's hyperthermia with a blocker 
iota resiniferotoxin, and now we don't see the prolongation of apnea in the LCR, suggesting that the thermal effects on the LCR are mediated by these trip V1 channels. So it's not all bad news though. It turns out that trip V1 channels are modulated by cannabinoid receptors, which are also calcium channels. And uh, they tend to be expressed on C fiber. I'm sorry, I should have said trip V1s are on C fibers because they, re they receive no susceptive stimulation, things that could hurt you, injured tissue. CB1 receptors are also on um, uh, the presynaptic vesicles in the NTS. And if you uh, give treatment with ACE, which is a CB1 agonist, you can shorten the LCR and you can actually compete the, uh, against TRIP-V1, which I'm not going to show you the data, but it, it looks like TRIP-V1 is the accelerator, CB1 is the brake, and they're both presynaptic and subject to regulation. So our picture looks like this. There are presynaptic receptors for CB1 and TRIP-V1 that regulate the amount of calcium here and therefore regulate the amount of glutamate that's released and the apnea severity and all done through uh, the presynaptic calcium. So CB1 is a therapeutic agent. That uh, doesn't seem very likely, but uh, nonetheless, it's theoretically it could be beneficial. So cigarette smoke's a big risk factor. We looked at that. I just wanna show you this primarily because we exposed uh, the babies in utero by having the mother exposed to cigarette smoke. And then when the babies were born, they were perfectly normal breathing, a regular environment. The mothers were no longer smoking. So this is your mother smoked your pregnancy, but you're not exposed once you're born. And yet when we studied them in what we thought was the infantile period, they still showed abnormalities. The babies exposed to cigarette smoke, especially when they were younger, this is postnatal age, had a markedly prolonged laryngeal chemoreflex and increased apnea durations. But this is part of the grow, outgrowing it. You know, pediatricians are very reluctant to cheat, treat children because they say, it's gonna outgrow it. And a lot of the times they're right. And, but so whatever happened in utero that prolonged the LCR, as the LCR diminished, which is part of normal development, these baby rat pups appear to have caught up with their peers so long as they were in a normal room air, non-smoke exposed environment after birth. So there is some recovery and some plasticity and the risk goes away. And the risk goes away after about one year in, in human infants. So we think that human smoking uh, enhances GABAergic transmission. I told you it's all about inhibition. Inhibition is greater in the babies of, uh, of rat pups at least that smoke. And it probably causes intrauterine hypoxia, delays development, and brain immaturity is associated with persistent fetal reflex responses, which are the apnea rather than the respiratory response to hypoxia. And the rat pups outgrew that. And it looks like many risk factors for SIDS operate through presynaptic mechanisms. And I think it's kind of interesting. The, the reflexes have to be in either greater and fire. They do, you can't wait around and modify the response. If the reflex is necessary, it's necessary now. And you better shoot the gun because that's what's required at this time. And you can't really control it once you've shot the gun. You can only terminate it. So the best defense is not to activate the apnea. Don't smoke during pregnancy. Keep the baby from uh, warmer environments or to have a powerful mechanism to terminate the apnea, which is the auto resuscitation response. This is from a mouse. And this is a picture of what happens when you expose them to hypoxia. It's at a small, uh, it's small because of the long time scale because I wanted to show the whole sequence. The mouse was exposed to anoxia at this point. There's an initial respiratory response. Ventilation goes up, but then it's inhibited by hypoxia. And we have this very prolonged apnea, a gasp, another gasp, another gasp, probably a small gasp. And then the baby recovered. Once they uh, apnea was present, we returned them to room air. So when they gasped, they were breathing room air. There's profound bradycardia, okay, which as gasping occurs, starts to recover. So there's something about gasping that allows heart rate and blood pressure to recover, okay? And we do this serial in rats and we, uh, and baby mice, and we uh, measure the 
quantitative aspects of the apneas that are introduced and the autoresuscitation phenomena. So successful autoresuscitation, complex set of sequential behaviors, gasping, heart rate, and it seems to have to be in this order. And apneas have to be inhibited, right? They're inhibited. You got to turn that off before you can start breathing. And then there's followed by an arousal. And each element is separable in my view, and I'll show you a picture at the end. So I want to turn to the, hypo the pathology findings because these are the things that have um, contributed to ideas about autoresuscitation. Richard Ney was a pathologist, and he noted that babies had astrocytosis, who died of SIDS. This is a collection of reactive glial cells that is thought to reflect previous hypoxia in the environment. He thought they had hepatic erythrocytosis and adrenal medullary hyper, hyper, hyperplasia, all of which are evidence of intrauterine hypoxia. The last two observations did not stand up to the test of time, but the, the um, presence of gliosis has astrocytosis. And the other thing is every pathologist looks at them and says, this brain looks immature. If you ask them what they're seeing, it's very hard for them to count it. But they all say the, baby, the brains of babies who died of SIDS look immature consistent with the idea that the absence of adequate oxygen in what is in a very precarious uh, environment in utero uh, somehow slows the process of development. So prematurity, brain immaturity for gestational age or postnatal age seem to be associated with SIDS. And I believe that the relative developmental immaturity is associated with unstable cardiovascular control and persistent and inappropriate fetal reflexes. So, the main thing the pathologists have used is, uh, have determined is that the number of serotonergic receptors, so receptors for serotonin are deficient in the brainstem of babies who died of SIDS. And they're deficient both on serotonergic neurons, those are 5-HT1A receptors, those are auto receptors that tend to be auto-inhibitory if there's too much serotonin released by a serotonin neuron, the 5-HT1A receptors tend to turn it down. And 5-H2TA, 2A and C receptors, and I'll show you uh, those in a moment. So um, autoradiography is an old technique. You take a radioactive ligand, you allow it bind to a thin slice of the tissue, you put it near x-ray films, the um, particles released as the radioactive substance breaks down, then causes the development of the film, and you squint at them quantitatively, and you can measure the uh, density of receptors. And here's a, a baby who died of not of SIDS of some other identifiable factor. This is in the um, uh, rostral end of the brainstem. And uh, this is the baby who died of SIDS. And you can see there's a striking difference in, in the uh, number of receptors. And it's, it's quantitative. You can uh, have uh, radioactive markers that release a known amount of radioactivity and therefore um, quantify this in terms of the number of binding sites. It's an old technique. Um, I know we all want to use the latest thing, but there's still uses for these older techniques. It's, uh, it's also true that babies who died of asphyxia also have deficient receptors. So there are a huge variety of receptors for a single cell neurotransmitter, evolutionary means of diversifying the effects of a single neurotransmitter. You can have different effects in the targets because you have different receptors. These are inhibitory usually, 5H2, a, C, and 5-HT3, which I'm going to tell you about, are thought to be excitatory, and they're usually on non-serotonergic neurons, and they're deficient on neurons in the brainstem that are involved in autonomic control, involved in respiration, cardiac control. So the serotonin is well-placed to be the missing excitatory element in making sure that autoresuscitation is successful. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that these are diminished. I'm not going to show you that. This is some recent work that just came out from Robin, and this is 5H2TA receptors, and these are different nuclei in the brainstem. This is the hypoglossal nucleus. This controls the tongue, opens up the airway, an important part of uh, waking up DMX. This is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. This is important in cardiovascular control. The NTS, this is where all the sensory information comes in. There's abnormal 5H2TA binding there. Uh, and let's see, these are parts of the olive. Um, the olive, I think, is actually part of blood pressure control in these babies, although I don't know that we're interested in investigating that next. 
the raphe obscurus and magnus, these are source neurons for serotonergic neur uh, neurons. These neurons release serotonin and they target these other nuclei. Um, the uh, Draginta cellularis is also a source of, um, of serotonin and the Paradraganta cellularis lateralis is, is close by. The IRZ is part of the uh, intermediate reticular zone is part of the arousal mechanism. It's activated in you right now when you focus your attention, when you're awake and uh, receptor binding is abnormal there as well. So there have been innumerable studies of different data sets, both 5-HT1A and 5-HT2A and C are reduced in babies who died of SIDS. And they're not reduced in every nuclei, but they're reduced in a lot of them. If you, if you look in aggregate, which is a paper we just submitted, it, it turns out that a large fraction of babies who died of SIDS have one or more abnormalities of serotonergic receptor binding. So, and this is all appearance to the contrary. I don't really think they're, they're normal. I do think that most of them have some serotonergic defect. The age by receptor interaction is kind of interesting here. You can see that babies who died at an older age tended to have lower serotonin receptors uh, density. And I think that this suggests that as infants get older, they have to have a greater defect. As their system matures, it becomes more robust and less vulnerable. And it's only vulnerable if they have a really severe de defect of, of serotonin. So younger infants with greater cardiovascular instability may die of SIDS even with relatively higher uh, serotonin receptor levels. They're the left end of those curves where the overlap is greater. At the right end, if you're going to have die of SIDS uh, and you're older, you have to have a more severe serotonergic receptor defect. So serotonin, what does it do to the LCR? If you inject, we micro-injected serotonin into the NTS in uh, neonatal rats, and it markedly shortened uh, the LCR, which so it's part of the arousal response. It's part of the rescue mechanism. It's turning the apnea off. Um, unfortunate, and saline did not do that. We looked at 5-HT1A. I thought, oh, well, surely this is going to be a 5-HT1A effect. Nothing happened. We looked at 5-HT2. Again, a, non, a rather nonspecific agonist, but it didn't have any effect. So we were kind of stumped, but then we looked at 5-HT3. And uh, they are widely expressed on presynaptic C fibers. So here's another C fiber, presynaptic receptor. And when we put in a, an agonist of 5-HT3, the CPG, it markedly shortened apnea and the LCR. So then the question is, where's the serotonin coming from? So ondansetron is a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. 5-HT3 is in the CTZ region of the brainstem. So ondansetron is used, which causes vomiting. It's used after chemotherapy to reduce the risk of vomiting. And it's a very um, selective 5-HT3 antagonist. So we gave AMPA, which is a glutamate antagonist, and we injected that in the caudal refe, activating serotonergic neurons, and that shortened the LCR. But if we put in AMPA in the caudal refe and on Doncitron in the NTS, we didn't see any shortening, implying that serotonin originating from the caudal refe is activating 5-HT3 receptors and therefore uh, shortening the LCR. So now my mechanistic uh, slide looks like this. We have the RAFA contributing serotonin that interacts with 5-HT3 receptors that shortens the reflex. And so this is one of the ways in which serotonin uh, is important in the process of autoresuscitation. So reduce serotonin as a risk factor for SIDS, I think, and that serotonin could come from the caudal RAFA. And I think it's uh, important in um, uh, regulating the autoresuscitation response. Wow, I'm gonna jump ahead. So typical of me. So I think that prenatal hypoxia makes reflex apneas longer. If we made, if we made babies hypoxic in utero by exposing the mother to intermittent hypoxia, the lar laryngeal chemoreflex was uh, accentuated. 
and uh, simultaneously it reduces the capacity of serotonin. So prenatal hypoxia is really a double whammy. You're more prone to have apneas, your brain is immature, you're more likely to have that more primitive, fetal, inward looking uh, apneic response, and you have a reduced capacity to generate autoresuscitation. So here's our current model, um, which I just showed you part of. There are certain neurons in the caudal rafe. They interact with the NTS through 5-HT3 receptors, which I showed you. They interact with the ventral respiratory group and the pre complex. This is other people's work, but they activate 5-HT2A and 2C receptors there, and they facilitate gasping. They also, if you inhibit the apnea, they also stimulate normal breathing. They increase hypercapnic sensitivity when you're apneic, CO2 builds up. If you have a more vigorous response to that, then you'll have a more vigorous arousing response. This is a 5-HT2, possibly a 5-HT7 receptor. But again, serotonergic neurons communicate with this part of the brain and may contribute to arousal through this mechanism. The periobrachial nucleus is the gateway to arousal ascending to the basal forebrain to the cortex to cause arousal. And serotonin interacts with all of these. And you can see that if you were deficient in any one of these, either in the number of serotonergic neurons or their activity, or these receptors were deficient and could not communicate effectively, that elements of autoresuscitation would be more difficult to achieve. So we've moved beyond the TRIPS triple risk model specific apnogenic reflexes, specific nuclei, specific receptors, specific pathways in the brain, and serving specific physiological functions. I just wanna show you one last thing. This is from a baby rat that was exposed to intermittent hypoxia. This rat died during the exposure. So here's where we gave saline into the, uh, I'm sorry, still water into the larynx. Here's the long apnea. There was some abdominal muscle activity, but, um, the rhythm the, the rhythm was uh, delayed. Here's a long apnea, here's some gasping, and then the animal died. It looks like a lot like hypoxic apnea. So uh, one of the things I'm interested in investing further is whether the circuitry from hypoxia from the cranial nerves uh, nine and 10 is convergent in the NTS. So failed autoresuscitation in the LCR looks a lot like failed autoresuscitation after anoxic exposure. And animal studies have focused attention on physiologically plausible mechanisms. I think we have been somewhat successful in the last 25 years. Enhanced apnea severity, reduced capacity for autoresuscitation. I think if you ask most people in the field, they would start using this language to describe what happens um, in sudden infant death syndrome. In future work, uh, I really wanna know if primary hypoxic apnea and the LCR are again, convergent. Um, you know the joke about the guy who lost his contact lens? Man comes up and says, can I help you? And uh, he's, sure, help me. I lost my contact lens. Uh, well, where did you lose it? Over there. Well, why are you looking here? This is where the light is. The LCR is easy to measure. I'm not sure it's the best model that we should. So I'm, I'm interested to study hypoxic apnea a little bit more um, and sort of go where more of the light is. I think that uh, reflux in babies is a risk factor for SIDS. I think that does activate the LCR. I think it does participate in some babies, but I think that hypoxic apnea is far and away the uh, more common phenomenon. Uh, I'd look to, like to look more at heart rate and blood pressure respiratory during gasping. This cat, this coupling, which restores circulation, reoxygenates the body, uh, is an important part of autoresuscitation that is understudied. And so We'd like to look at that by counting it better and then by using some of these microinjections or transgenic methods to uh, activate or turn off parts of the system and try to attribute uh, the failure of that particular mechanism to specific circuits within the brainstem. And I'd like to know uh, if prenatal or postnatal hypoxia act through inflammation. There's a lot of evidence that the dose response curve to oxygen is U-shaped. If you have too much oxygen or too little, there's increased reactive oxygen species formation. There's good evidence that reactive oxygen species interact, for example, with trip B1 receptors, sensitizing them, causing to be force correlated. So I'm interested in what is hypoxia doing? How is it delaying development? Things of that sort. We've only looked at prenatal. I'd like to look at postnatal hypoxia 
paternal smoking is a risk factor for SIDS. So continued hypoxia, continued nicotine in the environment is, is also a risk factor for SIDS. So we have not looked at the postnatal period, but that's what I'd like to turn my attention to next. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry it's such a whirlwind tour, but I hope you get a sense of how we're approaching this problem. Questions? Um, so one question that I had in terms of the sort of toward the end, but also in general is, the inputs to the NTS and their integration, because clearly child is prone. It's getting a lot of sensory inputs just about what's on the face, what's on the neck, et cetera. And so is, do you think that the NTS to the parabrachial in terms of the arousal response is also disrupted? And also does the serotonergic modulation of the NTS relay disrupt the, the arousal part of it? It's a good question, and I, I don't have an answer. There are kind of two levels of arousal. Many babies have a brief apnea and immediately arouse. They never get to the gasping. So there is sensory information mm -hmm. that causes an arousal long before you have these more profound reflex inhibitor right. period. And that's probably the response in most babies. I don't know too much about that integration. Yeah, and you know, and part of that is, is that is this something that is basically a synaptic disruption, or is there also a circuitry alteration? In other words, a developmental disruption of wiring the the brainstem upright, and that that's actually part of the risk. Okay, so I've got a couple of things for you as you move through your medical education as I answer Anthony's question. First, if you don't know the answer, never admit that. You say, I don't know that, but I do know this. Uh, okay, so what I know is that um, I think synaptic strength is not fully formed in these babies. That's part of immaturity. You know, there's this overgrowth of synaptic connections, and then there's a pruning phenomenon. There are two studies out there that say that babies who died of SIDS have an increased density of boutons, as if the connections were weak and not fully formed through what's probably a Hebbian process of uh, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. So Donald Hebb, arguably the greatest uh, neurophysiologist of the 20th century, really formulated ideas about how we learn. And so heavy in learning is the idea that with repeated firing, there are synaptic changes that increase the strength of those particular synapses and other synapses are weakened. So the other thing is if, other clue is if anybody asks you about anything intracellular, the answer is also always calcium, okay? Yeah, go ahead. It's actually kind of just going off of uh, Dr. Lamontia's question, looking at your future work and heart rate and blood pressure. As far as I understand it, the, the nucleus of the solitary tract also senses and responds to mechanical um, forces, it including families of the trip channel and the piezo channel, and they help to mediate the baroreflex, which seems to be also mediated by the serotonin system. So do you have any insight into how these mechanical and thermosensitive, as well as the serotonergic system, interact? In the NTS to produce I don't, the there's, there's been a lot of thought that multiple sensory phenomena are convergent in the NTS, and I don't find that plausible. I think they're kind of dedicated circuits for different sensations. Uh, what I'm more struck by is the differentiation between A and C fibers, that C fibers are really about self-protection. There's something bad out there. You must react. A fibers are more about Eh, we're going along. It's okay. Yeah, the world's out there. Yeah, no problem. And any any stimulus, I think, can be made strong enough to be giving you worrisome information. The water receptors that detect water in the larynx are actually in A fibers, and they cause an apnea. There's no doubt about it. But if you make it acidic, the apnea is much more profound, presumably because you're activating C fibers. So I don't I don't know about that convergence. You're right about the baroreflex. We haven't studied that at all. 
we might get involved in that in this coupling between um, the gasping and the um, changes in heart rate and blood pressure that generate reperfusion. I suspect that there's some permissive effect about vagal information, stretch receptors, which is a fiber information that comes into the brainstem. And in the setting of that, then the hypoxia can cause a tachycardic and a hypertensive response rather than a hypotensive and bradycardic response. But I don't, that's speculative. Well, most of this is speculation. That's even more speculative than the things I already speculated about. Okay. Okay, nice presentation. Um, I don't know if they are survivors of sick babies and if they are survivors, are they at higher risk of diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, pulmonary hypertension, and neurodegenerative diseases? Okay, so I have thought about this a lot. And once again, I don't know that, but I do know this, okay? <laughs> so first, does everyone know what the Barker hypothesis is? So um, during World War II, Dutch citizens were starved by the Nazis and babies who were raised in that setting, it turned out, had a higher risk of cardiovascular disease when they were much, much older. And Barker put forward this idea, I think he was an English epidemiologist, I could be wrong about that, uh, trust but verify. Okay, Reagan said that. So whatever I say, trust but verify. Um, the, uh, so the idea was that things that happen in utero and in early life could have really long lasting health consequences. And you're, you're asking a modification of that. And I don't know the answer to that question. I have speculated, well, here's my speculation. If you look at other disorders, some of them genetic, for example, look at cystic fibrosis. Once the CFTR was cloned in 1989, suddenly we had a new way of looking at the disease and people started to realize that there were adults who had never come to attention, but had an abnormal CFTR. And they might have had severe colds, coughing, a little phlegm production. And they had kind of a, a form fust, a partial form of CF. So if I were going to guess, I would guess that babies who have these risk factors do not die of SIDS, have a form fust of this autonomic instability. So I think they might have less robust cardiovascular control. Hypertension could be a risk. You might be right. You know, maternal hypoxia causes stress. Maternal stress uh, during pregnancy is associated with hypertension in the in rodent offsprings and susceptible strains. So I would look. You know, I don't think they're they're going to have um, you know a risk of uh, hepatic failure or something. I think they're going to have adult manifestations that are somewhat a reflection of we what we think contributed to their risk of SIDS, which is largely autonomic instability. That's what I look for. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Tony, did you, Anthony, did you want to? Focusing a lot on the centrifugals, but is there any evidence that the bagel would be able to make people out of those foods? In baby rats, the, the bagel output, for example, of the heart doesn't exist. You can block cholinergic uh, receptors on the heart and there's no change in heart rate. The bradycardia that occurs during these apnea is probably mediated by adenosine. So um, yes, it's abnormal. Is it abnormally abnormal in the babies, the rats that we think are susceptible to SIDS-like behavior? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so I had a question about the Aver C-type fibers. Um, so you mentioned that the C-type fibers were unmyelinated. Um, so I was just curious like, if they were a high you know, pathological urgency in terms of their response to you know, caustic environment or temperature, such as like a bird, why physiologically they wouldn't want to transmit more faster, quickly, faster? Yeah, I'm guessing that, uh, slow as they may be. I, I'm I'm guessing I, they're fast enough. The response is certainly vigorous. Uh, you know, we pull away from an open flame and things of that sort, but. Um, I don't know why. Yeah, I have no idea that, you know what, it, it, the evolutionary, yeah. You know, when people say that's a great question, that means they've already thought of it. 
That's a really great question because I hadn't thought of it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. It's good enough, you know, and evolution hasn't messed with it for that reason, I suspect, but that's hardly an adequate answer. I don't have a more um, mechanistically driven answer. Uh, I'm curious at the top of your model, you have the cortex and uh, is there any research on kind of the cortical top-down control in, in SITS? No, there isn't. There's, everybody who's interested in this focuses on the um, brainstem projections of phenomena that then lead to cortical arousal. They, there's, uh, there's no work that I know of about that. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Okay.